directions and got jerked around until finally he found out that you can't get there from here. Well, even if you're not trying to be a wise guy, some interesting things can happen if you, someone's asking you from directions. You know, people from away. What happened to me one time is I live on, in Somesville on Mount Desert. And uh, I was walking along the main drag there one time. And uh, this cat came by. And you have to drive right through Somesville to get a Southwest Taba. And it stopped while I was walking. And the fellow uh, rolled down the window and asked me for directions. And I noticed his, his cat was from uh, New Jersey, the Gadden State. Well, there's a handful of kids in the back there. And he, he rolled down his window and he asked me if this was a road to Southwest Taba. Didn't quite say it that way, though. It was more like, uh, <clears throat> is this the road to Southwest Harbor? <laughs> <laughs> so I looked at him and answered like any man who would. <gasps> <laughs> <clears throat> so he asked me again, is this the road to Southwest Harbor? So again, I answered him. <laughs> Kid in the back leans up and says, you try holding your breath for that? I guess he thought I had the hiccups or something. Finally, he asked me one more time. I guess he thought I was deaf by now because he's screaming at me. Is this the road to Southwest Harbor? <laughs> so finally, I thought I'd make it easy for him. I just said, yeah. <laughs> he still didn't know what I was talking about. He turned around and went the other way. I mean, these people are numb sometimes, but... Yeah, people from away, you know, if they've never been exposed to that, they get confused the first time they hear a Mainer answer the, in the affirmative. And I, I think most of you here are Mainers, but uh, if there are any people who, who that doesn't come naturally for, I usually try and give a language lesson to the people in the audience and have them try uh, one of these main yeses here. So you, you can humor me here a little bit, and at the count of three, we're just going <clears> to <throat> breathe in a little bit there for a main yes, okay? So the count of three, one, two, three. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> Not too much that day, because if you swallow the air, you'd be burping all night, you know. <laughs> and and I got to warn people, uh, you know, from away, they get really excited that once they learn how to do it, so then they want to show off, you know, for their friends and neighbors. Like, they'll take them out to some fancy place, you know, like the Jordan Pond House on Mount Desert, you know, where the, as soon as you sit down, they serve them big popovers. They can't wait to show off, you know. Meanwhile, they're eating them popovers, waiting for the waitress to come by. Meanwhile, the waitress comes by and says, are you ready to order? They go, <laughs> <laughs> All the waitresses down the pond house have to learn the Heimlich maneuver, get that popover popped right out of their mouth. We lose a lot of tourists every year due to that, so you're just a warning to be careful with that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, we get a lot of tourists up in, in Bahaba, and you'd expect that everybody, uh, you know, in the fishing business would, you know, appreciate the tourist season, you know, like the lobster fishermen. But, well, it kind of sometimes can make their life a little more difficult when they can't get their pickup truck anywhere near the town dock to unload, you know, because it's all crowded there by the tourists. So this particular song goes out to the tourists. Uh, it's written by John Campbell, and it's, uh, it's probably appropriate to any fishing town along the coast, yeah. Come some of a flock to the beaches and the docks. They got brown vinyl sandals and black nylon socks. They got a red peel and nose and synthetic clothes, and from June to September, it's anything goes. Where's my flip-flop? Where's the gift shop? How you feeling sad? When a bay come, when a bay go. That's your pack. When a bay come, when a bay go. Clam cakes and chowder and lobsters to go. There's a slick on the bay, a band of soleil, and Labor Day weekend seems like years away. <laughs> They're out fishing for flats, wearing Budweiser hats. They got a new Boston whaler with a cooler up and back. They go for a spin, loaded on gin, get stuck hat of ground till the tide comes back in. <laughs> They'll be gridlock at the town dock. How you feeling sad? When a bay come, when a bay go. It's a long rainy weekend with no place to go. There's a red tide today in a shack in the bay, and Labor Day weekend seems like years away. When the flea bites, jellyfish stings, how you feeling sad? Watch a mobster eat a lobster, how you feeling sad? They got sand in their eyes and a burn on their thighs. The last tuna grinder is covered with flies. There's a squid in the sink, the TV's on the blink. They got a bucket of crabs that's beginning to stink. <laughs> Citronella, beach umbrella, how you feeling sad? Winnebago come, 
Winnebago. There's no place to pack any place that you go. So let's count license plates from the Midwestern states and hope after Labor Day things will get straight. And hope after Labor Day things will get straight. <laughs> there you go. I thought I'd do one other ballad here uh, by Jan Hammond. It's about a fisherman who had a tough time of it. He, his name was Duncan. My uncle. I had an uncle Duncan. He come from Canabunkin. He lived on a Chinese junkin. Ordinarily, he was drunken, hide ho diddly daddle do hoist the sails, and away we'll go, and I'll tell you the tale, the tiddly tattle tale of the Duncan of Drunken, Duncan. <laughs> that last Duncan's your pack. Think you can handle it? <laughs> you give it a try here. The Duncan of Drunken. Duncan. Oh, pretty good there. <laughs> In the Gulf of Graugus Duncan, me unk took quite a Duncan into the sea curb. <laughs> Duncan, the my drunken uncle Duncan, hide ho diddly daddle do hoist the sails and away we'll go, and I'll tell you the tale, the tiddly tattle tale of the Duncan of Duncan. Duncan. Says he, who's that lousy skunk -o? who threw me any drink off the junk -o? It's the gold on sit into water down good gin, and, and with these words. He sunk, oh, hide, oh, ho, diddly daddle do, hoist the sails, and away we'll go, and I'll tell you the tale, the tiddly tattle tale of the Duncan of Drunken. <laughs> One night while in me bunkin, to me room come Uncle Duncan, says he, on the harp I'm a plinkin, it relaxes me while I'm drinking, hide, oh, ho, diddly daddle do, hoist the sails, and away we'll go, now I've told you the tale, the tiddly tattle tale of the Duncan of Drunken. I love leading people in them rousing choruses like that. <laughs> I'll be back in a little while. See you in a minute. <laughs> Men and I'd like to say hello to all you visitors here from fat and wide, whether wired or mellow. Well, welcome to vacation land where the weather changes to beat the band. Sometimes it's cool, sometimes it's hot. It sure does change an awful lot. Like Mac Twain said, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes and it might get better. If you can't see the end of your nose because the fog's so thick it stubs your toes, don't you worry, don't be blue. It's sure to left in a week or two. Let's get on down, east that is. I want to tell you about this lobster biz. <laughs> you folks might feel a culture gap, so I'm here to sing the lobster trap rap. The lobster you eat for your chow, how it got there, I'll tell you now. You know, they used to be so friggin' thick, you could walk to the shore, just take your pick. You might step right on them, oop, beg the padden, gather the mess to spread and your gadden. The upper crust turned up their nose and left that trash to the common Joes. Folks' whose noses may have been turned up, now they gotta pay right through them and cough it up. Five dollars a pound is the going rate at a restaurant, twelve dollars a plate, but you don't need anyone's advice to know that it's all well worth the price. If you think that lobster's great, if you think it tastes some good, let me hear you all say yes, the way a maina would. <laughs> the dance way now. The way a maina would. All right. <laughs> Gone are the days you pluck them off the shore. To catch them now is really quite a chore. First of all, you need a good, strong boat with a nice, broad hull so she's sure to float. You got the boat now, she needs a name. Call her your wife, your ex, or your favorite dame, the Betty Ann, the Bobby Sue, Guinevere Bertha, or the Susie Q, or name her after your old dog Rover, but never change a name or she might roll over. So let's say you name her the Susie Q and you paint her all white with a trim of blue. You got the boat, now you need the gear. Some jerks might start with a case of beer, but don't get soused while you're on the water. That's one thing that you had in order, cause sooner or later, if you're fishing drunk, 
you and Susie gets to wind up sunk. If you don't want to see Davy Jones lock away till she's in port, and then you dock her. Any fisherman who's worth his salt knows when and where to hit them all. If a lobsterman ran that Exxon tanker, that tub would have been brought safe to anchor instead of turning Alaska's shore all black. But now I've gotten way off track. Let's get back down east, that is. I want to tell you about this lobster biz. If you think their lobster's great, if you think it tastes some good, let me hear you all say yes, the way I mean I would. To catch a lobster, you need a trap. Folks around here, we call them pots. A wire one rust while a wooden one rots. Either one will do just fine. The lobsters don't seem to pay much mind. All they care is about the kind of bait you get from the fish plant by the crate. Rotten old fish heads that really reek are a favorite dish they like to seek. The net that holds them is called a pocket. If you were a lobster, you wouldn't knock it. They go right into what's called the kitchen to scavenge a meal. They're really itching for more free food. They go a little farther, wind up trapped here in the pallor. Now, don't you think I'm kidding you all? That's really what these things are called. There's not much to do once they're trapped inside, except wait for one of us to give them a ride up to the surface to check them on out. This may not be their final bout, because each one gets a careful look to see if they're really fit to cook. Of course, the big old females, all covered with eggs, are strictly off limits, so check them legs. The oversized breeders you got to protect if you want their numbers to stay in check. If one's too short, it's called the stinker. Get caught with them and you're in the clinker. There's bound to be other things in the kitchen. You don't want them, you just start pitching. Urchins, crabs, sea cucumbers. You'd be surprised at the numbers. More often than not, there's not one keeper. You might have to move the gangs out deeper. It's a damn hard way to make a buck. Success has little to do with luck. If you don't believe me, then go on out and see for yourself what it's all about. When a cold northeast begins to blow, pitching a boat back to and fro, first time folks you call them rookies, more often than not, they lose the cookies. Let's get on down east, that is. I want to wrap up this lobster biz. This state is cool, sometimes it's hot. It sure does have an awful lot of lovely spots. We've got the most from Mount Katahdin to the Rocky Coast. Some folks camp out in the dark of beautiful Acadia National Park, while others prefer a sweet deluxe and don't mind shelling out the bucks. But when it comes to food, you can't compete with a hot bell lobster and fresh crab meat. So check some out if you've got a mind. I'm sure you'll say it's the finest kind. So if you think that lobster's great, if you think it tastes some good, let me hear you one last time, the way a Mena would. Yeah. All right, thank you. <laughs> right. Believe it. Now, lobster really is a tough way to make a living, especially if the lobsterman in question ain't too sharp. The next fellow I'm going to tell you about, old Randall, he weren't too sharp. <laughs> now, uh, Harry Baskins earlier was talking about some fellow who wasn't firing on all cylinders. Now, you've heard different expressions of ex explaining that someone ain't, you know, playing with a full deck. You know, when usually when I ask people for, uh, you know, other ways of expressing that, they usually come up with, uh, oh, the, the light's on but nobody's home. Well, old Randall, his porch light was out, but the moths were still gathering. <laughs> <laughs> and some people say, oh, you don't have both laws in the water? Oh, well, Randall, he might have had both oars in the water, but they must have been in different ponds or something. <laughs> and then he was talking about genetic engineering earlier. Well, I think he could have used uh, some of that because, uh, oh, Randall, he must have come from the shallow end of the gene pool. <laughs> I mean, his feet weren't even getting wet. <laughs> There's a lot of ways to describe this. You know, in Maine, the common way to say is he's numb as a hake. Now, people from away don't know what I'm talking about because they don't realize that a hake is a fish. And I say, I explain that a hake is a fish. And if you can't figure out what being numb as a hake is, and so are you. <laughs> well, all these expressions are a good way to describe old Randall because he was all of these things and less. <laughs> if you catch my drift. <laughs> all right, well, uh, this is a story about old Randall and his had luck by uh, Ruth Moore. The old Randall was a fisherman who couldn't make a cent. 
his gear would break, his warps would pat, his fish hooks all get bent, the crabs and the horse eggs that his bait before lobsters could, no matter where he set his traps. It never was no good. Go home, go home, O oh Randall, and set your traps no more. The amber leaves of autumn are falling on the shore. Oh, soon will come the snow squalls, the nights without a star. And if you fish in winter, you'll be worse off and yeah. You can help me with that, Pat. <laughs> you'll be worse off and yeah. Well, Randall kept on going out. And one sunny day, he found a blob of greasy stuff floating around the bay. He said, I found some amber grease. <laughs> sure smells awful strong. <laughs> But it was nothing but an old cow moose that had drifted round too long. <laughs> go home, go home, old Randall. This luck is not for you. There are no silver quarters here or pennies for your shoe. This is an old dead animal. I'll come floating from afar. And if you don't heave it overboard, you'll be worse off than yeah. Well, he could not patch his rubber boots. His wife, she had no dress. And all they ate was mush and greens to fill their emptiness. But Randall kept on fishing. Each day found him outside till his poor wife could take no more. She stabbed to death and died. Stay home, stay home, oh Randall, she's got no other kin to wrap a towel round her head and underneath her chin. The neighbors, they'll come looking, they'll gather near and fat, and if you leave a lie in there, you'll be worse off than yeah. Well, that day, he caught a hollow bit. It was as big as a pack in space. And when he hauled it up to look, it had his old wife's face. When he put a hand to her, the hook it up and bent, and the damn thing bit his finger off. Turned around and went. Go home, go home, oh wind, oh don't carry on this way. The icy tides of winter are roaring up the bay. The sea is loud and lonesome. It's heaving and the barren. If you keep on wearing out, you'll be worse off than yeah. Well, Randall went another time, and on that last black day, a pirate ship sailed around the point, head up the bay. His sails were red as dogfish blood. His flag was mean and bold. But Randall said, Oh, this is my chance. He's going to beat with gold. Mm -hmm. Go home, go home, oh, Randall. Go, don't grunge yourself no more. The amber lights of sunset are lit along the shore. Oh, soon will come the darkness, the night without a star. And if you chase down Captain Kidd, You'll be worse off than yeah. But Randall piled the power on. His engine smoked and strained. He chased all night till morning light and saw that he had gained. Old Captain Kidd come out on deck. He wore a dreadful frown. He cried, Run out the cannon and mow old Randall down. Go home, go home, old oh, Randall, go where you belong to be. The amber lights of sunrise are shining on the sea. Old oh, Captain Kidd's a maxman, he sights you from afar, and if you catch his cannonball, you'll be worse off than yeah. Well, old Randall, he caught the cannonball, <laughs> felt the awful shock, flew ten feet up in the air and sunk down like a rock. Down in the kelp, we saw the crabs, creep out and wave their claws. And his last words bubbled upwards. Well, I ain't no worse off than I was. <laughs> now, thank you. Well, talked quite a bit about lobster and I should uh, do one last ballad here and uh, focus on clamming because that's the way a lot of folks make a, a decent living if they're good at it and uh, I'm going to tell you about a clamor that some people say was the best clamor in the whole state of Maine and you wouldn't think of it neither to look at this fellow because he weren't even five feet tall and he was about as wide as he was tall too but and you can't tell things by looking at people because the best fisherman down to Bat Harbor has only got one amp. Yeah. Last summer he caught a fish that was this big <laughs> Just pushing your leg there. <laughs> no. Now, Harry, he was a good clamor. Really good clamor. <laughs> and he had a girlfriend named Mary Muggins that he was wicked fierce to marry. But she kept putting them off because they couldn't see eye to eye too well. And this is their uh, story by Albert Bailey. Harry Herman, he was short and fat, but the best clam digger on the Popham flat. And he often said, with a touch of pride, I can dig six barrels on a ten-foot tide. 
Mary Muggins, she was tall and slim, but she promised old Harry she'd marry him. But she kept on stalling when to be his bride. Cause we look so silly setting side by side. Well, Harry Herman said, well, I won't wait. So quit your fool and set the date. If we keep delaying, we can both be dead. And I know another woman up to pop him head. <laughs> Mary Muggins, she began to stew. She really didn't know just what to do, but at last she said, well, I'll be your bride. When you dig six barrels on a 10-foot tide, <clears throat> Harry Herman, when the moon was full, gave his hoe a polish and his boots a pole. He got his skiff and was waiting round, right on the spot when the tide went down. <clears throat> Well, Harry Herman, he began to dig where the holes were thickest and the clams was big. And when the tide had reached its low, I dug three barrels and got three to go. Harry Herman, when the tide was slack, had two sore arms and an aching back. But he kept on digging away like sin, because I got to get the clams before the tide come in. Well, Harry Herman, when the tide returned, was seeing visions and his windpipe burned. Oh, oh yeah. And when the tide got to where he stood, <laughs> I fell five barrels and I, I fell dumb good. Well, Mary Muggins, she began to shout, You can't dig clams if the tide ain't out. Well, quit your chatter, I ain't through yet. I've dug them dry and I'll, I'll dig them wet. Well, Mary Muggins, she began to tease. The tide is rising up around your knees. Well, it surely makes digging slow, but I only got about a bushel to go. Mary Muggins called, make haste. The tide is rising up around your waist. Well, let it rise up around my neck. I want them clams and I'm short one peck. Mary Muggins cried, come in. The tide is rising up around your chin. Oh, I may never get back alive, but I'll get them clams if I have to dive. Well, Mary Muggins was about to pop. Oh, Mary, you know, if you'll only stop. But the only answer from down below was a little stream of bubbles that told her, Boom! <laughs> was found anchored to the bottom just where he drowned his hoe was clutched in both his hands and the pockets of his overalls were full of clams <laughs> but when the moon is high and the tide is low you can still see Harry and his ghostly hoe he keeps on digging even though he's died till he digs six barrels on a ten foot Die. Well, that's a terrible way to end that ballad. It's kind of the same way the other one ended. Well, wait a second. If that's the last one I'm doing, we can't have a sad ending like that. Even though that's the way it was written, and uh, we can have poetic license here. It's a live performance here. We can pretend the whole thing is, uh, oh, maybe on a video thing, we have some editing equipment here, and uh, <laughs> we've got uh, a little remote control here. We'll press fast rewind, see what it takes us back to. <laughs> Poor Harry was just one clam shy. Mary heaved a heavy sigh. She dove right in to help him out. <sighs> now they're happy as clams as they dig and spout. Mm. <laughs>